Okay, last time we talked about the integrated rate laws for reactions involving only one reactant for a first, second, and zero order reaction. But in many cases, we have multiple reagents that might react together. So then the rate law der derivation is a little bit less straightforward. So let's suppose we have, like, I don't know, two reagents, A plus B going to C plus D. In the case of a second order reaction that could be first order in both reactants A and B, our overall rate for this second order reaction would be have dependence on both the concentrations of A and the concentration of B. Um, so you can actually solve this. So we could still uh, set our rate equal to the differential rate law. So negative dA dt, the consumption of A is going to be equal to k A over B. And then again, so we would approach the problem in the same way, integrating from uh, time t to over to time 0, and from the concentration of A at time t to uh, uh, A at time 0. And so I won't go through all the math, but suffice it to say, the final answer has to involve both concentrations of A and B. And then so the solution, for those of you who have taken math more recently than I, which should be all of you, is this fraction involving initial concentrations of A and B times the log over this fraction. And then this is going to be equal to KT. Um, so as you can see, what this is, I'm just trying to show you, like, if we were to try to solve a multiple reagent reaction, which is, you know, many cases in chemistry, the integration of these rate laws quickly becomes more complicated. So in practice, when you're running a kinetic experiment and you want to find the rate law, um, one, the, the way you typically do it is we will run the experiment under what's called pseudo first order conditions. Um, this is also known uh, in some, I guess, older literature as flooding. So the idea is, in practice, if we have, uh, let's say, a rate again. So we're trying to do a rate equals, let's say, two reagents, A, a to the x, B to the y. And our unknowns that we want to solve for is we want to solve for our order in A and B, in order to get, and as well as K, to get out our final rate law. Um, and then it's not practical to try to fit a decay to some crazy expression every single time. So what we do for pseudo first order conditions, what we can do is, if we set, if we use a huge ton of reagent B, so let's say if B, the typical number you want to do is greater than 10 times A. So I guess these would be our initial concentrations. So what this means is that if A and B are stoichiometric, um, as this reaction proceeds, we're always going to have a huge excess of B compared to A. So what this means is that this B, the concentration of B will not change a lot. So what we're doing is we're flooding it in B. So right, for example, if the reaction proceeds 50%, We'll lose half of our concentration of A, but we'll, only, we'll still have 9.5 equivalents, at least, of B. So overall, what this means is that B at times T is going to be approximately equal to the initial concentration of B. Right? So B, that's because we have a huge excess. So this is what's called under pseudo first order conditions, because now if B at times T is approximately constant, what this gives us is so our, our rate is going to be k, right, I'm just rewriting it over again. And what we're saying is this is going to be constant because, again, we're flooding it. So what this gives us is if this is constant, we can rearrange this expression and then now dA over dt or negative dB dt for this, this reaction that we're writing here is going to be equal to a new constant 
So what we're going to do is we are going to combine our original rate constant, the real rate constant, with this expression, which will be approximately constant. So together, this will be a new constant, which we'll call k obs. So the observed rate constant. So this will give us a new constant. And then this will be then times a to the x. So what this means is that now, these, this is what's called pseudo first order conditions, because now we only have um, we only have one dependence, which will be on the concentration of A. So now we can solve this exactly in the way that we did it in the last lecture. So what we can do is, now because, again, B is constant, or because it's so high, what we'll do is then we'll start plotting our data of just A versus T. So for example here, so if we're plotting A versus T, we have several different scenarios to solve for X. So one scenario could be the concentration of, sorry, a at times t, if this is linear, then obviously, from just from the equation that we talked about last time, that this therefore means x equals 0. This is a zero order reaction. And then this slope is going to be equal to uh, negative k. Great. So that, oh, sorry, right, rather negative k obs, right, because we're under a new thing. So this is how we derive k obs. If, on the other hand, um, we have some sort of curvature. So we're plotting A at times T. And then we see something like this. One thing we could try would be a first order condition. So if this is a first order decay, what we would then do is take the log of A at times T. And then if now this is linear, right? then now we know that the slope here is going to be slope equals, and then therefore x equals 1. Um, and then finally, if we then do, uh, if, we, if this doesn't linearize, if this is not linear, if we took the log and it was, let's say, if this was log of a versus time t, and we still see curvature, then maybe this is a second order reaction. And instead, what we need to do is then plot, hopefully it's going to cut off, if we then plot 1 over a at t, then we should see some sort of line. And then this slope is going to be k obs. So this is the first step. So from these different processes, we can then, uh, sorry, this, this therefore x equals 2. So this will be the case for a second order reaction. This will be how we linearize a first order reaction. And then this is how we linearize a zero order reaction. So with all of this process, so sorry, this little rectangle, this gives us, importantly, this gives us k obs, and this gives us x. So now we know the order in A, and we have the, rate, the observed rate constant. And then from there, the second step, which we'll talk about in the next video, will be how to go from k obs to y and the actual rate constant.